Good morning, First Korean, and good morning to everyone who's joining us today. May God richly bless you as you worship with us. And thank you to everyone who's taking part. Sometimes we carry heavy burdens, and there is none heavier than the burden of guilt and shame. But burdens can be lifted. Let us worship God. Our call to worship is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 to 22. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, as we worship you today, may your presence be real to everyone engaged in this new form of digital worship. May this Lord's Day be a day of restoration and renewal for each of us. We acknowledge and thank you for your daily protection. However, we need your strength and patience as we adjust to all of life's circumstances. Help us avoid putting others and ourselves in danger by our actions as the lockdown restrictions are relaxed. We pray for your special blessing on each of our PCI Global Mission workers as they share the gospel in many challenging situations. May we support them both financially and prayerfully in all that they do. We pray for two of our own missionaries, Peter and Anna Crawford, who plan to leave Lisbon on the 2nd of July and move to a new work in Athens with European Christian Mission. Lord, guide our congregation committees and treasurers as they manage congregational budgets and also decide how best to implement the government's job retention scheme. O oh Lord, we pray for those involved in the business and retail sectors as they plan the restoration of operations that are both safe for their customers and also economically viable. We ask for your wisdom for government departments as they devise and distribute advice on the relaxation of the lockdown rules. Gracious God, may your Holy Spirit enable us to keep growing in our faith and help us to share your love with others. May those who are suffering bereavement, ill health, loss of employment, or any mental or spiritual anxiety, find peace as they are directed to the source of all comfort, Jesus Christ, who in Matthew 11 verse 29 said, 
Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Finally, Lord, we pray that you will speak through your servant, Reverend James. May he be aware of your direction as he opens up your word to feed our wayward minds and hearts. And may each of us listening today be attentive to your message and be refreshed and encouraged for the days ahead. All these prayers we ask in the mighty name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Last week, we learned one of the parables that Jesus told. Today, we're going to look at another parable about a son who wanted to run away from home. Let's read the story together. Jesus once told a story about a son who wanted to run away from home. He didn't think that his dad was giving him the best life. So he asked him, Dad, give me all the money that you owe me and I am going to go and live my life how I want it. The dad was very upset by this, but he didn't want to force him to stay. So he gave the son the money that was owed. And the son ran off to the big city with all of his money. And he spent his money wherever he wanted, buying lots of nice food and drinks and spending time with friends. He was having a great time, buying whatever he wanted, being with his friends, doing whatever he wanted to. And everything was brilliant for a while. And then the son ran out of money. And when he ran out of money, his friends didn't want to be friends with him anymore. And he didn't have anywhere to go or any money left. So he had to get a job. And the only job he could get was working in a pigsty. And he had to eat with the pigs and live with the pigs and sleep with the pigs. And he had to eat what they were eating. And it was disgusting, it was horrible. And he thought, what has happened? This is terrible. I have really messed up. Here I am, living with pigs, eating this disgusting food that is meant for the pigs. In my dad's house, all of the servants have food. They have enough to eat. And yet here I am, living with pigs. The son had realised that he had made a big mistake. He had really messed up. And he thought to himself, I wonder if I go back, if I go back home and say I'm really sorry, would my dad let me come and be a servant in that house? Then at least I will have enough to eat. So the son set out on the long journey back to his house. And all along the way on the road, he was thinking to himself how sorry he was about messing up or wasting all the money. And he thought, I'm going to have to say sorry to my dad because I have really messed up. And as he was coming along a wrong, windy road, his dad saw him in the distance. And guess what happened next? His dad ran out to him and hugged him. And the son said, Dad, I am so sorry. I really messed up. And his dad hugged him and said, son, I forgive you. Let's go and have an amazing party to celebrate that you have come home. And so his dad ordered everyone in the servants and in the house to get the best food possible and the best drinks. And they had a wonderful party to celebrate the son coming home and that the dad had forgiven him completely. Isn't that a wonderful story, boys and girls? That even though the son messed up, he wasted all his money, he ran away from his dad. The dad forgave him and welcomed him back home. And this is a parable that Jesus told us to help us to learn something about God. You see, boys and girls, sometimes we can be a little bit like the son, can't we? We don't do what's best for us. We think that we know what we want and we make mistakes. We turn away from God. 
But this story teaches us that no matter what we do, if we go back to God and ask for forgiveness, he welcomes us with open arms and he forgives us because he loves us so much. So let's remember this amazing story of the prodigal son and remember that God loves us so much that he forgives us when we say sorry and we can have an amazing relationship with him. I love gardening now, but I used to hate cutting the grass when I first lived in a country manse. And for those of you who don't know, country manses here in Northern Ireland usually have very, very big gardens. So back then, I had a bright idea. I thought, I'll get a goat. It'll eat the grass so I don't have to cut it. That was until someone said to me, James, you know that the congregation will talk about the owl goat at the manse. I'm sure Jacob was feeling like an owl goat as he ran from home. It was a hazardous journey. A hazardous journey, a hard pillow, a hangdog conscience and a heavy heart. Those are things that make men think. Those are things that make men dream. 
Jacob had been on the road two days. Beersheba to Haran. 500 tough miles. It was a journey back in time too, retracing the steps of his grandfather Abraham. Abraham had stepped out in faith with God. He had heard God speak and stepped out in obedience. But Jacob was on the run. It felt that the heavens were closed to him and the silence was deafening. All he could think about was Rebekah weeping, Isaac waving, and Esau on the warpath. Two days walk, two days to think, two days to ponder, two days to wonder what might have been. The narrative here paints two distinct pictures for us, Jacob's perception and God's promise. In the first part of the story, we get a vivid picture of what Jacob is seeing, and it's pretty miserable. It's evening. Night is falling. The heavens grow dark and cold. Jacob is alone. He's near the city of Luz, but he dare not go in. He doesn't know how he would be received. So outside of community, on the hillside strewn with rocks and boulders, Jacob makes his bed, and he rests his head upon a large, flat stone. Homeless, worthless, helpless, alone. Did he not say to himself that night, how did I get here? How did this ever happen to me, Jacob, son of Isaac, grandson of Abram, bearer of the promise of God, running for my life? How did that happen? He only had himself to blame. He was the one who cheated his brother. He was the one who lied to his father. He was the deceiver. He was the scoundrel. He was the one who broke up the family. Jacob, you owl goat. You absolute fool. No wonder you sleep uneasily. No wonder you dream strange dreams. Your heart is heavy because your conscience is guilty. Have you been there, you owl goat? Of course you have. Because we all have. We have all felt that heavy heart, that pang of shame. And we can make excuses and point the finger and say, if so and so hadn't done done such and such. But we know. We know because we've all felt like Jacob, homeless, worthless, helpless, and alone. It's a very hard pillow to lay your head on. At length he drifted off into an uneasy sleep and while he slept he had one of the most famous dreams in all of history. Genesis 28 and verse 12 says, And he dreamed, and behold there was a stairway set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. He dreamed of a stairway from heaven to earth, and where it met the earth was exactly the spot he was lying. On the stairway, Jacob saw angels going up and down, like a heartbeat sending blood around the body. Angels ascending and descending, ascending and descending. Now, forget Hollywood angels and wings and soft fluffy clouds and Philadelphia cheese and harps. Few have ever seen the glory of an angel. God rarely draws back the curtain, but those who do are greeted with the words, do not fear, for the sight is terrifying. Here, in this critical moment in the story of the promise, Jacob is allowed to see behind the curtain. He sees angels being sent out and returning to God, taking messages and bearing messages, answering prayers, providing protection, constantly at work, a constant connection between heaven and earth. You see, there's a reason why Jacob was a cheater. He cheated because he thought God was far away from him. He had the same picture of God that a lot of people have today. A God in heaven who wound up the universe like a giant clock, set it running and then busied himself with other things. To Jacob, God was too big and too vast and too magnificent, too almighty ever to be concerned about someone like him. And we all feel like that sometimes, don't we? Maybe God loves me. 
I know the Bible says he does, but it's a big world and everyone's got problems and he's got a lot to take care of. How could God have time to worry about me? And you can see where that leads. If God is not personal, if he's not concerned about your life, then you're left pretty much on your own. Nobody's going to take care of you but you yourself. And so that's what you do. And that's what Jacob did. He cheated because he thought God didn't notice or didn't care or was too busy. And he took matters into his own hands. But Jacob was wrong. And we are wrong when we think that way too. In the vision alone, God is telling Jacob, I am nearer to you than you think. And I am constantly, every moment of every day, in every situation and every circumstance, working for your good and for my glory. Jacob, I was with you in Beersheba. I was with you when you tricked Esau. I was with you when you deceived your father. And I'm with you tonight. And I will be with you when you go to Haran. Everywhere you go, I will go with you. But then God speaks to Jacob. God had never spoken to Jacob before. For all the years of his life, God had never spoken directly to him. To his grandfather Abraham, yes. To his father Isaac, yes. But to Jacob, never. For his whole life, he had lived on borrowed faith. The borrowed faith of his father and grandfather. He was raised in their faith. He was taught their faith. He knew their faith. But he had never had a personal experience with the God of his father and grandfather. To Jacob, it was all second hand. But then, God speaks. He speaks to the owl goat. As C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasure and he shouts to us in our pain. I know where you are, Jacob. I know all about you. You think you're homeless? Jacob, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You think you're worthless, Jacob? But I have a plan to give you the land your head rests on. And beyond what you can see to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. You think you're helpless, Jacob? I will protect you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You think you're alone, Jacob? I will watch over you wherever you go. I will not leave you. Jacob, I will be with you. Jacob, while you're worrying about Tuesday, I have Tuesday sorted and Friday already in the bag. You think you have problems today. I have already sorted the problems you don't even know about yet. Don't you want to scream at this old goat? Jacob, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on what you think you know. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Well, Jacob wakes up from his vision, and he begins to put the pieces together in his mind. Surely the Lord is in this place, he says, and I was not aware of it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And he decides to set up an altar. And he calls the place Bethel, the house of God. Now looking at this whole story, it stands as a statement about the nearness of God at the moment of Jacob's deepest need. It's a story about how close God was to Jacob in his desperation. It's a story about how God reached down to him. A story of the grace of God finding Jacob right where he was. And you say, that's great, James. That's a super story about Jacob. And I'm glad that vision was such a great help to him. I'm really glad that God spoke to Jacob. But James, this is 2020. I certainly feel like Jacob many times. Many times I've felt the crushing guilt and shame of the things that I've done. Like him, I've felt I feel homeless, worthless, helpless and alone. It just about sums up life for me. But for me, James, there's no vision, no dream, 
No stairway down to where I lie. No voice. Just silence. The heavens are like brass to me. But you can't understand this story until you hear what Jesus says about it. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, when Philip met Jesus for the first time, he was so excited that he hurried off to tell his friend Nathaniel. We found the one that Moses spoke about, he said, Jesus of Nazareth. Now that doesn't, didn't impress Nathaniel one bit because Nazareth was just a tiny village in Galilee. And Nathaniel asked that famous question, can anything good ever come out of Nazareth? Well, Philip's response was quite sensible. Come and see for yourself. Come and see and make up your own mind. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel coming, he said, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. Now, you might pass over that statement, but it ties directly to our story. Because, you see, Israel was the name given to Jacob by God himself. If Jacob meant cheater, then Israel meant per a person who prevails with God. Jesus was reminding Nathaniel of the story of Jacob. How do you know me, said Nathaniel? I saw you under the fig tree, Jesus said. Now, we don't know what Nathaniel was doing under the fig tree. It appears that only Nathaniel knew what Nathaniel was doing under the fig tree. And he's dumbfounded that Jesus knows. Surely you are the Son of God, he said. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Nathaniel. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You see, the stairway in Jacob's dream is not a thing. It's a person. Not a what, but a who. Jesus is the one through whom all things were created, through whom all things are sustained. He is the connection of heaven and earth, the one through whom all the plans and the purposes and the promises of God are fulfilled. You don't need a stairway a series of steps uh, or commandments or noble truths or pillars when you have a person, Jesus. He is the gateway of heaven. You might lay your head on a soft pillow tonight and you may not have a dream like Jacob dreamt, but you have something far better. You have Jesus, God's final word. Because of Jesus, all the promises that were made to Jacob have also been made to you. He is the only one who can deal with the oil goat, the crushing guilt and the shame, because he bore it on the cross for you. You think you're homeless? Because of Jesus, you have an eternal home. You think you're worthless? He died for you. In Jesus, you have an eternal inheritance. You think you're helpless. In Jesus, the angels ascend and descend to your side every moment of the day and night. The Lord of hosts is on your side. You think you're alone. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with you, right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I've messed up things in life and in the lives of others, some by accident and some quite deliberately. I know I am like Jacob in many, many ways. And many, many days the accuser has made me feel like that old goat. Thank you for your great love for me and Jesus. Though you know all about me, still you meet me where I am. Forgive my hard-heartedness and my slowness to turn to you. I believe your promise. I trust your word. I lean on Jesus. In his name. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with you this day 
and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Take a